Cybercrime is a $6.9 billion criminal enterprise, and year over year, it continues to go up. But we've had cyber and technology since the early 2000s and the dot-com boom. So why is it that we're not getting any better at defending and reducing the amount of criminal enterprise? In this video, we are talking with Dr. Ross Anderson, a professor at Cambridge, on his thoughts around why cybercrime continues to be rampant, and he offers up some pretty interesting novel solutions on how we as a society could actually mitigate down that risk. It's a fantastic conversation. It's part of a three-part series that I filmed with Dr. Anderson, so check out the other ones on the channel, but let's get in and see what he thinks. The FBI just released uh, a report on the 2021, so we're filming this in early 2022, on the 2021 uh, essentially cyber crime report. And the FBI in the United States, they have a IC3, which allows any, any business, uh, maybe just in the United States, to call in and report that they've been victimized through some type mm -hmm. of cybersecurity crime. And they, they, they help those victims, but they also collect metrics and report uh, annually on this. And we can see that in 2021, um, cybercrime has gone up to $7 billion, which is up about $2 billion from last year, uh, 2020. But the the um, amount of crimes being reported didn't go up that much. So we're seeing kind of the similar amount of crime, but at a much larger volume of dollar impact. I'm just curious on your thoughts. You, you wrote the paper in 2020, or excuse me, 2000 around why information security is hard. And here we are 21 years later and it's just rampant with cyber crime. Do you have any thoughts around why the direction is going this way? And, you know, maybe what, what can be done or what the evidence is showing on why what's not working? Well, um, we've done a couple of very relevant surveys, one on the costs of cyber crime in 2010 uh, we looked at what cybercrime cost people across the economy in the UK, the USA, and, and, and also worldwide. And we came to the conclusion that pure cybercrimes, the kind of offenses that never existed before computers, um, were costing everybody in America, Europe, Britain, you know, a few pounds, dollars, euros per head. So maybe, you know, a billion or two billion in a country the size of America. Second, um, the... Um, the kinds of crimes that existed before but whose nature was changed by computers, such as credit and debit card fraud, were costing each of us several tens of dollars, pounds, euros. So, um, you know, low tens of billions in America. Um, and, and, and third, the legacy crimes like tax fraud and uh, tax avoidance and um, welfare fraud and so on were costing each of us several hundreds. But on, on top of this, the preventive measures that we took, principally to push back against cyber criminal infrastructure, were costing each of us several tens of pounds or euros or dollars per year. So that is all your expenditure on things like antivirus software, which is there in order to push back on the existence of things like botnets, right? That's costing in the same um, scale of harm as, as credit card fraud. Now, here's the interesting thing. We redid that work in 2017, 2018, and we produced a paper called The Changing Costs of Cybercrime. And we found that almost nothing had changed. All the numbers were roughly speaking the same. There are a couple of small changes. Telecoms fraud were down because people don't make long distance phone calls anymore. They use WhatsApp and ransomware was starting to tick up. But apart from that, the picture had not changed. Now, the amazing thing is this, that between 2010 and 2018, we completely changed our technological infrastructure. Because first, everybody started going online using phones rather than laptops. Second, um, servers moved from on-prem to the cloud. And third, you suddenly get social with everything. And yet, despite this generational shift in technology, cybercrime hasn't changed. So what that's telling us is that cybercrime patterns are not a function of technology. They're a function of the underlying incentives, the socioeconomic structures. They're to do with the fact, for example, that the typical cybercrime is a low-value crime committed against an individual by somebody in a different jurisdiction, right? So, for example, you try and rent an apartment you, you, you send a deposit of $1,100 and the, the, the person who receives the deposit just uh, absconds with it, right? The police aren't interested. It's below their threshold for dealing with fraud. 
it's below the threshold for referring it to the FBI to consider extradition. And so the perpetrators of these frauds get off scot-free. These are the kind of factors which have left us with the cyber criminal um, ecosystem and infrastructure that we have at the moment. And if we're going to change that, we're going to have to have some um, radical thinking. Um, one of the ideas that I've um, put forward from time to time was actually an idea of the late Professor David Wheeler here, which is that you randomize enforcement. So if you get defrauded of um, $1,000 in an accommodation scam, and the FBI aren't going to take a fraud seriously on, on, unless it's for at least $100,000, then instead of telling you to just take a hike, they should uh, flip a, a coin with 100 sides and with probability 1%, they should go after the perpetrator. With, with, that, with the full force and then make it the uh, a big force. splashy story? Yeah, uh, you know, send the Marines in through his bedroom window or start walk him on CNN or whatever, you know, yeah. do the business on him. And, um, and this means that if you've got somebody, um, you know, sitting in his apartment in Berlin in Germany who has gone and um, done um, accommodation fraud on a thousand different people for a thousand bucks each, then sooner or later his number, number will be up and the German police will break his door down and he'll be part walked. Yeah, and we saw a similar approach in, uh, I want to say it was like early 2000s with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, where uh, people were stealing music with Napster and LimeWire and Kaza. And they, the United States government basically went after three or four people and made, you know, a $8 million fine for just a, you know, John Q. Public type individual. These, these ridiculous fines that, you know, were, according to the law, appropriate. Um, and I don't know if it resulted in a, um, a sharp decline in the amount of stolen music that was being done. But in my mind, um, you know, I was 22 in, in 2002. I remember it being rampant. And then I remember it being like, oh, crap, I don't want to be that person. So there is merit to your, your idea, uh, Dr. Anderson, and being a deterrent. Well, the, where randomized enforcement helps is if you have got some individuals who do a large number of small value crimes in foreign countries. And there was one guy in Germany who was running accommodation frauds against our students for several years, for example, and we were trying to get him arrested and we couldn't. Um, but, um, you know, we should design the system so that by the time anybody's got away with a few hundred thousand or a few million in small uh, crimes against individuals, there's some mechanism for them to get their door broken down. Yeah, absolutely. I, did, so, yeah, I, I like your idea. It, we got to do something because if it's only, t you know, 10 pounds, $10 kind of impact to an individual end user, it, you've never been victimized. It'll never garner that public outcry for remediation. And I think that that's part of the, the root problem, right? Like, you know, if a business yeah. gets hit for 60 grand, it's like, oh, well, whatever. It's faceless. It's capitalism. Uh, it's a cost of doing business. But you know, if, if everybody's getting hit and it's really pinching your budget and it's a, it's a impacting you personally, then it, it begins to, you know, become a, a, a social topic that, you know, people want to talk about. Well, um, the, the, it is a social topic in terms of the standing of the police and trust in the government. Um, in the UK, for example, we expect that this year about 1 million people will be victims of um, a traditional acquisitive crime you know, car theft, bike theft, something like that. Um, and about two and a half million people will be victims of some kind of fraud or scam or abuse. Now, that's out of 28 million households. So roughly one household in 10 is going to suffer a fraud or scam or abuse this year. Now, if the typical such uh, case ends up being reported as a credit card fraud and the typical loss per um person per year for credit card fraud is about 40 or 50 quid, that tells you that about one household in 10 might be victimized to the tune of 400 or 500 pounds this year. Now, that's not nothing, right? That is really annoying. And mm -hmm. when, uh, particularly for poor people, and if poor people go to the bank and say, hey, how come this uh, 400 pound debits in my account? And the bank just says, well, our systems are perfect, so you must be mistaken or lying, go away then that secondary victimization causes additional hurt and anger. And if the person goes to the police and the police says, you know, I'm sorry, you must report this to the bank, not to us, that's our procedure, 
um, then people will start to lose confidence in, in, in the police as well. And, you know, given that the fundamental social contract is obedience to the um, state in return for protection, if the state's no longer providing the protection, then, you know, why should we provide obedience? Why should we pay our taxes? Why should we vote for the police rate when, you know, the um, local government elections come around? Dr. Anderson, I could talk to you forever, <laughs> honestly, but uh, this is our time. I want to thank you, like, really, really thank you. I genuinely appreciate you taking time, coming to talk to the Simply Cyber community, bringing a lot of thought-provoking ideas. Um, Guys, if you if you want Dr. Anderson's page, if you Google his name with Cambridge, he's got you must have a hundred academic research papers across various topics, uh, mm -hmm. including economics of information security, which is my personal favorite to read. Um, go check it out. He wrote the book literally on security engineering. Um, it's he made it freely available as well. I think some of your courses are freely available. There it is. Yep, yeah, this, this 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 is the book. Um, yeah. the um, there's half a dozen um, chapters you can download for free, and the old editions are completely for free. And um, I've also got um, videos of security engineering classes that I do for um, first-year students at Cambridge and a separate um, set of classes that I do for fourth-year students at Edinburgh. And these can all be downloaded from my website. And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put all the links in the description below so everybody can be able to get right to it wicked fast and start consuming um, your your education, your knowledge, and your your research, frankly. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. I hope to speak with you again and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Well, thank you, Dr. Roger.